today is Friday, April 5th, 2019. My name is Kyra Mann, CEO of Mito Action, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's call. We're excited to have Dr. Fran Kendall talk with us about the power and pitfalls of DTC testing. Um, so just a few housekeeping items before we get start started. The slides for today's call are up and available on the Mito Action website. And that is www.mitoaction.org slash Kendall 40519. And that will take you directly to the page. And on the right-hand side, you'll see a link that says View Slides. So you're able to follow along with Dr. Kendall's presentation. Again, that's www.mitoaction.org slash Kendall, K-E-N-D-A-L-L, Four zero five one nine. So today's call is being recorded, and we encourage you to visit our website to re-listen re to the information, as well as sharing today's great information with your family, caregivers, your medical team, or anyone you think will benefit from today's call. To access the recording, you'll visit the MitoAction website at www.mitoaction.org. And on the upper left of the main landing page, you'll see a green button that says Mito Podcast, Listen Now. So here you'll be able to find not only today's call, but many podcasts filled with great information. So I encourage you to come back, visit the website, and take a look at all the topics available to you. And our, today's call should be available um, by the end of business today. So at the end of the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session, so please feel free to email email us your questions at info at mitoaction.org. Jamie DeRosier, who's the Director of Patient and Family Support, will facilitate the Q&A and will be asking the questions on your behalf. So please be sure to email us all your questions all throughout the presentation. So let's get started. I'm honored to be here with you today to bring what we hope will be great information that will benefit each of you on your journey with mitochondrial disease. Today's speaker, Dr. Fran Kendall, is one of the pioneers in the field of mitochondrial medicine and is a Harvard-trained, board-certified clinical biochemical geneticist who founded the very first mitochondrial disease uh, clinic in the United States. With decades and a career specializing in metabolic mitochondrial and inherited disorders, Dr. Kendall founded one of the first commercial laboratories focused on rare metabolic and mitochondrial disorders. She pioneered telemedicine and private practice in rare genetics by founding VMP Genetics, which has branches branched into three divisions, direct patient care, education, and physician-to-physician -physician support. Dr. Kendall serves as the head of genetics for a large hospital system. She has authored chapters on mitochondrial medicine for medical texts and numerous research articles. She provides lectures at medical schools and nursing schools on these disorders and is a frequent guest speaker at medical conferences on mitochondrial disease and autism. Dr. Kendall often acts as an expert witness in federal court cases and has appeared on national news outlets to offer her expert opinion. She currently sees children and adult patients from around the world in either her VMP genetics clinic offices in Atlanta, Georgia, or by telemedicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fran Kendall. Thank you very much. Uh, that was quite the introduction. So um, hopefully I'll live up to all of that. Uh, <clears throat> again, uh, <laughs> I'm Dr. Kendall. Um, and today's topic is in regards to direct-to-consumer testing. Now, while this is not um, directly linked, of course, to mitochondrial um, care per se, um, it certainly does have an impact on the um, population at large and, and certainly even the mitochondrial community specifically. And it comes up frequently in our practice. Um, and so as a result, um, I thought I would address some of these, some of these issues, both um, positive and negative in regards to direct-to-consumer testing. So before I, I get started, um, I just want to encourage everyone to pull up uh, the slides if you haven't done so already. Um, of course, I'm going to talk about each slide, but it would be helpful to have that information in front of you just so that you can call, um, follow along more readily. So uh, I direct your attention to the um, slide number two, 
Um, and um, and before we get started, we have to define what is direct-to-consumer testing. So to define uh, that, that type of testing, it is um, a genetic test that are advertised and sold directly to the public. Um, it offers information that may include things like ancestry, your risks for developing certain conditions, uh, carrier status for some autosomal recessive diseases, uh, predicted drug response, and non-disease um, traits such as things like eye color. So these tests, however, are not considered diagnostic um, and offer risk information for only a limited set of conditions. So that's the definition of, of direct-to-consumer testing. Now, um, on slide three, who offers direct-to-consumer testing? So I've listed here, uh, it's not all-inclusive, of course, but I've listed some of the more common direct-to-consumer testing entities, um, and some of which uh, probably everybody is familiar with, to include things like 23andMe and Ancestry. So again, there's other um, groups out there, but these are some of the more common ones. Um, everybody has a little bit of familiarity with them. So. Um, having kind of explained what a direct-to-consumer test is and, and where these tests are available, what are some of the, the positives or the power of the direct-to-consumer testing? So on slide four, I outlined some of those potential uh, benefits. So it, it, this type of testing may promote awareness of genetic disease. So a lot of things that most of us aren't familiar with, um, if you do some of that testing, you might all of a sudden hear about diseases that you were not familiar with in the past. It may provide you with some personalized information about your health and disease risk and other tra uh, traits. It can potentially allow consumers to take a more proactive role in their health care. Um, certainly, it, it offers a means for people to learn about their ancestral origin. So um, a lot of things are can be family lore, or we think that's the case. So we might think we're Irish, but we are actually German or, or any other number of ethnicities. So um, we can learn that type of stuff from some of these studies. Uh, it doesn't require approval from an insurance company or a healthcare provider, and the results are available relatively quickly. So generally within weeks to maybe, I think it's up to six weeks for some of these studies, you can get some results. And then the data can be added to a, a large database, and that may be used for further medical research. And so depending on the company, the databases may be um, may represent up to several million participants. So that's that's quite a large group of patients to kind of um, glean data from. So these are some of the potential benefits of this direct-to-consumer uh, testing, but there, there are definitely limitations. And, and that is the, my primary goal for today, is to make you, as the mitochondrial community and the public at large, um, aware of some of these limitations so that if you decide to pursue some of this type of investigation that you understand what, what it's useful for and what it's, what it's not useful for. So if you go to slide number five, um, again, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the limitations of this direct-to-consumer testing. So the first thing that you need to be aware of is that certainly you might find some unexpected information that you receive about your health or your family relationships or ancestry that may be stressful or upsetting. So for example, you could learn that your dad's not your dad or that you are adopted or, or some of those type of things. And if you were not aware of that uh, prior to the testing, that, that certainly can have a profound impact on your understanding of your, your family uh, and those relationships. Um, the second limitation is, is that uh, people may make important decisions about disease treatment or prevention based on what could be inaccurate, incomplete, or misunderstood information from their test, uh, testing result. And so this is, this is a big uh, point um, that I'm going to expand on um, in, in future slides and, and further discussion. Because for me personally, as a geneticist, this is the thing that's most concerning to me uh, for the public um, at large. 
Um, the next is that there is currently little oversight or regulation of testing companies. Um, next, unproven or invalid tests can be misleading, and, and there may not be enough scientific evidence to link a particular gene change that they find with a given disease or trait, but that information may not be readily relayed to you when you get that type of report back from one of these direct-to-consumer testing companies. Um, your genetic privacy may be compromised if a, if a testing company that uses your genetic information um, um, in an unauthorized way or if your data is stolen. And so, for example, the company may sell your data to corporations or research groups or may work with law enforcement. And there have been some cases, I think there was a, an unsolved murder case out in California that was um, solved using some of this direct-to-consumer testing and determining um, family relationships. So there are positives, but again, you just need to be aware that, um, that some of this information can be compromised or provided to other people and you may not have been okay with, with that. Um, and next is the results of your genetic testing may impact your ability to obtain life disability or long-term care insurance. So <clears throat> that may be an important point. Uh, I don't think it's been, we have enough data yet to know whether or not um, some of this direct-to-consumer testing that may just say that you have a variant in a gene may be ultimately utilized um, to prevent you from getting particularly life and disability insurance and those type of things. Okay, um, what are some of the other limitations? So I'm now on slide um, number six. And um, in the United States, the FDA restricts direct-to-consumer testing companies from offering products that function as diagnostic tests. And in a little bit, I will read a statement from 23andMe in regards to how they see uh, their testing and what it offers and what it does not. But, um, but having said that, in April 2017, the FDA um, did authorize 23andMe to market genetic health risk tests for 10 different diseases. And I'm not going to read all of these. Um, but that includes things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, celiac disease, Gaucher, um, and, and a, a handful of other disorders. Now, um, the risk assessment, however, that they provide you for these 10 diseases is based on the presence or absence of a limited list of genetic variants in the sample, um, which are statistically higher and effective versus healthy people, but not necessarily causal of the conditions because of other factors. So uh, lifestyle factors, environmental influences. So again, they look at 10 diseases um, and they look at a couple of different variants and they will give you some general type of, of health risk. But again, this goes back to my, my earlier point with this type of testing is that you have to be very careful and aware of what the limitations are in, t in, t in terms of the data that you're getting. And, and you have to be, um, you have to understand how to interpret that for your own use and purposes. <clears throat> and none of the genes associated with these conditions are, are comprehensively sequenced or analyzed. So they don't look at these genes in the detail that a diagnostic uh, laboratory would. And then nor do the tests include all of the genes that have been associated with these conditions. So again, some diseases um, will have multiple genes that can cause that disease. So if you have concerns about that disease because of clinical symptoms you might have have or family history, if you utilize something like this direct-to-consumer testing, uh, they may look at just the, at a couple of the common variants and you may look at that and they might be negative and you might think, okay, I'm not at risk, but when in actuality you have a variant, for example, in a gene that's an uncommon gene associated with that disease. So you would get, in that case, a false sense of reassurance that that's not what's going on with you, but in essence, that really may be your diagnosis. But as I indicated, um, they were only looking at some of the common variants. Um, so I'm going to expand on, on 
that information with the with the following example, which explain, uh, explains that in more detail. So, on uh, slide number seven, again, this is an example of direct to consumer gene risk analysis. So. On, 20, on 23andMe's genetic health risk test for Parkinson's, they report um, just one variant in each of two genes. So these LRRK2 and GBA genes both link to Parkinson's phenotype or clinical presentation. Um, but there are additional known pathogenic variants in these two genes. Um, and they do not report out changes in genes known to be linked to um, Parkinson's disease like the SNCA and the PARC2 and Parkin genes. So again, this is a, a, a clear example of what I kind of um, mentioned and segued into this, is that you have a disease like Parkinson's that can um, be be uh, that can occur in a patient due to a change in multiple genes, but things like direct-to-consumer testing will only look at some of the more common or known pathogenic changes. Um, and so if you're going or doing this test for the purposes of I have the disease or I don't, you can't utilize it for that purpose. If you are just doing or trying to gather genetic information on your family at large and you just would like to know if you have a couple of the common uh, variants, then that's that's reasonable. But but otherwise, for disease diagnosis, it's not it's not a comprehensive genetic risk assessment. In contrast, my last statement um, speaks to that. So diagnostic tests are comprehensive with analysis of the full coding sequences of all genes associated with that disease, and the results of any used by your clinician or provider to guide disease management or surveillance. So again, if, if you're looking for actual diagnosis, you have to be mindful that you're not going to get um, all that information with one of these direct-to-consumer test studies. So let, um, let's move on to raw data analysis, um, and, um, and this is on slide eight. So what does that mean? So um, what, although the FDA uh, prohibits most direct-to-consumer companies from offering diagnostic genetic tests, some companies will provide their, their what people refer to as raw data um, if requested. And so, so again, you might get a report back that says you got these variants, but you want all of the information to see if you can do a deep dive into it. And so they will um, provide that to you, and then patients can access interpretive services that are available uh, for their for analysis of that data through a fee-for-service th third-party company. So again, you get the testing run by some place like 23andMe, and you might get a lot of data that you don't know what it means. Then you can go to these third-party uh, companies that will, will analyze it in more detail for you. But there are some issues with that, and so I want to emphasize those issues um, as characterized in the study in 2017, uh, where the study looked at third-party companies um, and that they found that they operate by um, looking at publicly available databases. Well, on the surface, that may seem okay, but um, despite uh, despite reports that the majority of classifications in some of these databases is incorrect, uh, resulting in, for example, the interpretation of some of these changes as pathogenic when they may just be benign variants or what we refer to in medicine as benign polymorphisms, which means changes in a gene but that are not disease-linked. Um, so again, um, the problem is, is that some of these third-party companies are, are basically using databases that are not necessarily accurate. And so they may be just taking the information then that you're giving them and then coming back and telling you that you have this issue or this change, when in actuality they may not be changes of concern at all. 
Um, in addition, these companies are providing information to the consumer, again, that the assumption that these variants in the raw data they are interpreting are actually true abnormalities in the first place and not false positives. So again, um, you know, all laboratories have have issues at times, and so they are just taking this data and they're they're being um, they're assuming that what they're getting from these companies is accurate in the first place. So that might not even be the case at all. So again, you you have these entities that are providing you with uh, these genetic kind of blueprints or or information about your genetic material, but it does have limitations. Um, and again. Some of these um, changes in some of these genes, for example, the Parkinson's um, that I that I mentioned or or went through, is if you're looking for that disease specifically because you're symptomatic or otherwise, this is not the avenue to take to do that. So on slide number nine, I just wanted to to bring up um, and read for you folks. The 23andMe statement on, on testing and clinical utility. Um, and they made the following statement regarding the clinical utility of their direct-to-consumer testing. So this is their statement. It says, the test is not intended to tell you anything about your current state of health or to be used to make medical decisions, including whether or not you should take a medication, how much of a medication you should take, or determine any treatment. And these carrier reports are not intended to tell you anything about your risk for developing a disease in the future, the health of your fetus, or your newborn, newborn child's risk of developing a particular disease later in life. So this is, again, a statement directly from 23andMe. Um, and basically what they're telling you is if you have grave concerns or considerable concerns about a disease or a disease process. This is not the avenue to go to confirm or negate that definitively. So to address that further, I was going to talk a little bit about a study um, that um, was published out of Ambry Genetics. So Ambry Genetics is one of, um, one of the larger um, commercial clinical diagnostic genetic laboratories. Um, so <clears throat> those labs include, you know, Ambry, GeneDx, Baylor Genetics Lab. So there are some of the names that you all might be familiar with or, or have um, had your own testing completed through. Now, before I go into this, I just want to briefly say, Kara, I, I'm hearing some feedback, like some no background noise. I don't know if um, the folks at home are hearing it as well. So it's a, it's a little bit distracting. I'm not sure where it's coming from, um, but if there's anything that we can do about that, that would be awesome. But again, I don't, I don't know if anybody else okay. is hearing it. Um, I'll, I don't so, hear it, but I'll remute the line. Okay. All right. Okay. So, okay. Thank you so much. Um, so the, again, the test that I wanted to um, to, to talk about today is, is um, published by a group uh, with the data from Ambry Genetics. Um, so it was published in Genetics and Medicine in 2018, so just last year. So I put the reference on my slide for those of you who are looking at the slides so that you, uh, if you have any interest, you can certainly access that as well. So let me tell you a little bit in summary what these folks found that kind of support um, and, and address some of the issues that I've already talked about. And again, this is for, for awareness purposes so people know how to interpret this data and approach it. So Ambry looked at um, analyzed variants previously identified by direct-to-consumer testing and raw data analysis in 49 patients between January 2014 and December 2016. Um, and so 91.8% of the patients were, were female. Um, close to 75% were unaffected by disease. So again, these um, primarily women were doing this testing, but they were not reporting or didn't have any symptoms. Um, and at least half of them were between 30 and 49 years of age. So 
in 44 or essentially 45 percent of the cases a single site analysis was ordered to confirm direct to consumer raw data finding so what that means is that they were just they folks had found some variant in one gene and the clinicians of these patients were going to Ambry Genetics saying, I want you to look at this variant. So about 90% of the testing was for cancer genes and then a smattering of a couple of other genes. Um, and so they found that 60% of the variants were confirmed, but 40% of them were false positive. Um, and the latter most commonly found in the in the more the, the common BRCA1 and 2 breast cancer genes. Um, and this is the latter point is the last point on this slide is is the one that I want to emphasize um, specifically. And so there was a misclassification of the variants by the third party interpretation services. Some of the uh, variants were variants that were found in the general population at frequencies much too high to be associated with disease. And so one of these variants was found in 25% of the general population. So what does that mean? So 60% of the variants that were found by this direct-to-consumer testing were actually present. But in 40%, they were completely false positives. Um, and so either the variants were not found at all or the variants that were present and had been classified as of something of concern were actually just population variants, meaning something that a good percent of the population has and is not associated with disease. As you recall, I mentioned earlier that um, that um, that these raw data analysis companies are using um, databases databases that are not medical databases. These are not databases that are being kept up by the scientists and the, the PhDs and MDs who are analyzing the data for these laboratories and modifying the databases based on accumulated data. So that, that certainly puts these databases they're using at risk for misinterpretation. And that's exactly what's happened in, in a number of these cases. So. On slide 11, I kind of summarize kind of what are the lessons that we get from this specific study. Um, so there is a, a very high false positive rate. So some of you may, may look at that and say, well, 60%, that's not, not bad. But in medicine and science, a 40% false positive rate is, is not an acceptable rate for a test. Um, that leads to a lot of, you know, anxiety and other issues um, and, you know, repeats in terms of medical testing and increases cost. And again, that's not something that would in a clinical laboratory be accepted as an okay rate of false positives. Um, again, as, as mentioned, there's a high incidence of discrepant classification or misinterpretation of variants coming from the direct-to-consumer companies and third-party services. Um, Another lesson that we've learned from this is that it's critical that clinical confirmatory testing be performed on any variants that are reported in the raw data provided by a direct-to-consumer company prior to any changes in medical management to confirm the presence or absence of the variant. Um, and so again, if you're just doing this because you just think it's interesting and you're not going to do anything about it, it may not have any, you know, that might be fine. But if you're using this for diagnostic purposes, you certainly don't want to, um, to make decisions. The other lesson we've learned is that many direct-to-consumer genetic tests do not include comprehensive gene analysis. And the last part, and this is again, a critical um, issue is genetic testing needs to be interpreted by somebody who understands not only the data that they're looking at, but can interpret it in the context of other factors, such as your own individual um, personal and family medical history. And so, again, these are all the things that, that looking at the studies that have been completed on direct-to-consumer testing as well as some other issues. These are the kind of the lessons that, from my perspective, we take away from some of this information that's that's being generated. Now, having said all of that, 
you know, what's my biggest concern? So I outlined that on, on slide number 12. So my biggest concern as a clinician is that the AMBRI study data was generated on 49 patients whose providers knew enough to refer for additional testing. But my concern is how many people are out there with false positive data making poor decisions for themselves and their families based on inaccurate information. Um, and that, that can be making decisions for themselves and, and based on inaccurate information and, and misunderstanding this on behalf of both the patient but also other providers who are not familiar with the limitations of this testing. I've had patients tell me that they have had providers who tell them to go do 23andMe to help diagnose them. And so that's concerning to me um, as a geneticist and as a healthcare provider because you know, you can just imagine a, a terrible case scenario where a, a woman does some testing and finds that she has a variant in a, in a BRCA1 or 2 gene, and perhaps there is a family history, but, um, but in actuality that variant really is a benign change in the general population. And then she proceeds to do some significant, um, you know, make some significant medical decisions based on that and perhaps her physician not understanding that these are not clearly diagnostic. So what if somebody undergoes a bilateral mastectomy or, um, you know, has their ovaries removed as well due to concerns about ovarian cancer? And so, again, these are, these, I, I, I'm certainly not here to say that there are, are dozens or hundreds of women doing that, but these are the concerns that I have for people making major life decisions without knowing for certain that they do have, um, have the disease. So the, the next couple of slides, and I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to bore all of you with any, uh, in any great way <laughs> in terms of reading all the details about these statements from the American Society of Human Genetics the American College of Medical Genetics, or um, even the, the NIH. So, but I think, you know, the, the bottom line is, is that all of them address the issues that I brought up for all of you today in regards to the, the, the pitfalls and the powers of this testing. Um, and, um, and that, again, that includes, um, you know, understanding where it's helpful and where it's not. I think I will read to you um, the shortest um, statement from the National Institutes of Health. Um, the direct-to-consumer genetic testing may promote awareness of genetic disease, allow consumers to take a more proactive role in their health care, and offer a means for people to learn about their, oh, there's a typo in there, sorry about that, their ancestral origin. However, consumers are vulnerable to being misled by the results of unproven or invalid tests and may make important decisions about treatment or prevention based on inaccurate, incomplete, or misunderstood information about their health. So I think the NIH did a good job of concisely kind of um, stating what it is that those of us who do have concerns about the testing and what those issues are for us in terms of our, our basic concerns. Um, now, where is the, the federal government in, in the regulation of, of all of this testing? Well, you know, as is usually the case with with life in general, things happen and then we scramble on the back end to try to figure out what to do or how to address it and what to, what to do about some of the issues that may crop up. So I, there are definitely federal concerns for direct-to-consumer testing, and I make note of those on slide number um, 16. And so in November of 2017, so a little over about a year and a half ago, um, Dr. Doctor, Doctor, um, Senator Chuck Schumer um, called on the, F, the Federal Trade Commission to regulate consumer DNA testing. And so um, Senator Schumer cautioned that these kits put consumer privacy at risk. That was one of his, his biggest concerns because the DNA firms could potentially sell personal and genetic information um, because it's not really regulated. 
So um, he was calling on the, the Federal Tr um, Trade Commission to investigate and ensure that the privacy policies uh, are clear, transparent, and fair to consumers. Um, and so I'll just read a little bit of a statement from him. So that was his, that was one of his big focuses. Again, as a geneticist, that is certainly of concern to me, but mine are more in alignment with those concerns um, that the NIH expressed in terms of the, the false utility of that, that information in making decisions. But um, his statement is, when it comes to protecting consumers' privacy from at-home DNA test kit services, the federal government is behind, um, Schumer stated. Besides putting your most personal genetic information in the hands of third parties for their exclusive use raises a lot of concerns from the potential for discrimination by employers all the way to health insurance. That's why I'm asking the Federal Trade Commission to take a serious look at this relatively new kind of service and ensure that these companies have clear, fair privacy policies and standards for all kinds of at-home DNA test kits. We don't want to impede research, but we also don't want to empower those looking to make a fast buck or an unfair judgment off your genetic information. We can find the right balance here, and we must. And so again, this was a statement made out of his office about a year and a half ago, when he was um, directing his concerns to the Federal Trade Commission. But um, that, that statement kind of expands a little bit more about his particular concerns, but also other issues. So to my understanding, I don't think there's been too much movement. Um, there, there, you know, there may be some, or they may still be investigating it. But, but the good news is that it's, it's hit somebody's radar, and so hopefully some of these issues will be addressed. So, um, you know, again, in, in kind of in summary, um, for some of the things we've talked about, and I know there's lots of questions out there about direct-to-consumer testing, and so I've I've kind of hit the high points with the the um, the with providing the opportunity for probably about 15 minutes or so of, of questioning before we we end for today, but. Um, but again, um, you know, this genetic testing is out there. Um, it is available to anybody with a, with a mouse and a phone and a, a way to get the kit and send it off. And so as a community, I think we, we have to recognize that it, it is available and that some people will utilize um, this type of testing. But my goal is not to um, say to folks that they can or cannot utilize this type of information, but where the limitations are. Um, and again, what, what are, the, what are the, the, the things that, that can be helpful? And so lots of people I know have used it for <clears throat> ancestry purposes, um, but unfortunately, as I indicated, I do have patients who, who come to me with concerns about any number of diseases with uh, profiles from 23andMe, and, and I, I have to emphasize to them that while I, I um, understand where they were coming from when they did the testing, that I can't use it for the purposes of diagnosis. And I, I, I would if I could, but, but I can't do that, um, not as a clinician, not being tasked with, with protecting your health. Um, and so I can't, I have to use other more scientifically based and, and controlled uh, approaches to, uh, to your testing and your diagnosis, whether it's with mitochondrial disease or another genetic um, disorder. So, so that's how, again, I approach it. I'm as guilty as everybody. I, I've done uh, ancestry for the purposes of, of where did my family come from, um, and, and that was a fun task. But, but again, I've not utilized it for any other purposes, and, and certainly would not um, for a disease um, di disease diagnostic um, perspective. So, in um, in ending today, um, I found this kind of cartoon. Um, online, and they assured me it was free, so I included it, um, and there was no copyright issues, but you can see that this is a, a, a woman who's standing in her doorway and over her business, I assume, and it's Know Your Future, and she will do palm reading and tarot cards and DNA screening. So while that's 
certainly humorous, I mean, it's certainly in the context of our discussion. Today it does bring or emphasize some of the points that I made in terms of, like with most things in life, you need to approach them cautiously. Um, if it's um, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. And so, as our office will often tell people in regards to the fact that some of this testing is ninety nine dollars, we will tell them if we could do a ninety nine dollar test and have all the answers, we certainly would. But unfortunately, um, that's that's not the case. So, again. Um, you know, this is a very hot topic, and people engage in, in utilizing this testing on a daily basis. And so because it has come up, not only for us in our practice, I'm certainly I'm certain it has for, for other geneticists and, and um, other colleagues. And I know for MitoAction and UMDF and some of the other um, the other foundations who are out there uh, trying to support you the best they can. I know they get inquiries about uh, direct-to-consumer testing and its legitimacy, and so it had come up, as I indicated, multiple times, so I thought I would provide at least some information to you folks so you can address this in a more, um, with more knowledge and more understanding and make the, the best decisions you can for yourself. So with that, I'd like to um, say thank you for your attention, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Kyra and, and any questions um, that anybody has posed, and I will do my best to answer them. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in, in these companies and the details of their, their product, um, but, um, but I will be, do my very best to, to answer any questions that are, that are posed. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Kendall. This was really helpful. And as you said, we do get a lot of questions from the community about the validity um, and accuracy of these tests. So, you know, to be able to give the community a sense of, as you said, the powers and pitfalls so that they can make the best informed decision for them is extremely helpful. So we appreciate you sharing that information. Um, so now let, we'll open it up for, uh, open up the call for questions. Um, as I said, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email them um, to MitoAction at info at MitoAction.org, and then I will turn it over now to Jamie DeRosier, who will facilitate the Q&A. Jamie? Yes. Hi, everyone. So I want to thank you guys so much for joining us, and I do encourage you guys to stay in touch with us and join um, our team at MitoAction. And feel free to email us, again, at um, info at MitoAction.org. Um, I did have a few questions that came in, uh, so let me start with the first one that had come in to us. So someone had come, um, sent one in and said, um, if you are willing to share your thoughts on the Nubella genomic services and may differ from the other DTC options. I don't know if you, did you hear well, that one? I, I, I okay. did, I'm not, I think you said Nubella, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Yep, that's how it was spelled, um, uh, and N-E-B-U-L-A. Well, the first thing I can say is I don't, I can't really address it because I don't really know um, okay. anything about this particular service. Now, I just, you know, having said that, um, you know, the bottom line is I think the issues that we addressed need to be considered for that company as well. And again, I don't, you know, if the, if the, the caller has any more details, I can, I can address that. But again, I don't, I'm not familiar with them specifically. So I don't know how they or how they're positioning themselves in terms of how they might be quote better than the other labs. But um, you'd have to be very mindful of what, what they, they're trying to relay to you about what they do that's different to the other than the other direct-to-consumer testing, meaning, um, you know, do they validate things with, with standardized testing? You know, who interprets their data? Um, you know, all of those type of, of, of things, what databases do they use? So, you know, anybody can say anything about their product, but you have to, you know, be confident that it really is what they're claiming it is. I can tell you I'm not aware of any direct-to-consumer testing laboratory that would not, um, that, that I as a geneticist would not confirm um, in, in retrospect in terms of, of uh, concerns about a specific disease. Okay. Well, thank you. 
so th we have so many patients and families that are on this call and listening and obviously on their mito journey um, um, long journeys and um, have probably a lot of questions about these t tests at home and I'm sure this one's come up a lot um, is there any of these at-home tests that people can take that would determine if they are on the spectrum for mito <clears throat> not not in my opinion I mean see that what, what I've seen from these studies is that people will come in and they'll have they'll say that they've been found to have variants in some of these mitochondrial genes um, and, and that may be the case but but that doesn't confer disease and so the problem again with it is is that it's I we won't even accept the data in our office because I, I know I can't utilize it for anything. I have to look at people with fresh eyes. So the, the diagnostic criteria for mitochondrial disease are, are, are fairly specific. And as a matter of fact, they're getting a little bit even more um, specific in terms of some providers coming out saying you don't have a mitochondrial disease if you don't have a gene diagnosis. And I, that's a whole discussion for another day. But but the point is is that you have to have you know that you have to have very specific gene mutations, biochemical abnormalities, histological changes, all of these things that I as a mito expert am familiar with and know that I need to utilize for diagnosis. So somebody coming in with a constellation of findings that might be linked to or can be seen in mitochondrial disease with these variants or, or changes in, in some mito genes, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't confer a mitochondrial disorder. So I would say to them, and I don't know any of my colleagues who would take the data, so I would say to a family, if that's your purpose, if your purpose of doing this direct-to-consumer testing is to find variants in mitochondrial genes that you can then use to direct your your care whether it's to get to the right specialist or not i would say in my opinion i would i wouldn't you, you know spend your money to do that because none of us can use it for true diagnostic purposes so it'll be discounted in the end anyway okay that was that actually leads me right to my next question i think you answered it I, it was would would a doctor use this testing and would look at this testing in their office would you actually take this and analyze the data if you did the at-home testing, so yeah, so it, okay. so yeah, yeah, and and I did. I I can't use it. And the other thing that that I think some people um, have misperceptions about about genetic testing in general is they you know they'll say okay I I I had my exome done at you know Ambry Gene DX wherever, and I asked them for the raw data. And they'll say, then they'll, they'll, they'll say to me, you know, they'll get the report back, of course, and, and that focuses on certain things that are linked to their, their disease, but particularly if they don't, they're not found to have a diagnosis, some people then go to the labs asking for, again, what they refer to as raw data. So it's all the information. And then they'll come back and say, well, can you look at it? Well, no, I can't. And, and that's not because they don't want to, or I don't want to help or any of those things, but I think people need to understand and as a clinician, I don't have access to databases to analyze all these variants. You know, this is, to, to, without the appropriate tools to assess the, the data you're finding, it's just noise. You know, you don't, you don't know what it means. And so <clears throat> that, that's why you have to be very careful about that in terms of, you know, if you go to, you know, again, Gene DX or, or Ambry or one of these labs and get your reporting and then get your raw data and then you go to one of these third-party interpretation services, you have to be very mindful that their databases are, are not nearly as good as the ones that you just got the, the, the information from. So... But that's why, like, again, you know, I, I, you, you have to interpret it in the context uh, of, da of databases and information. So that's why I won't, I won't take stuff like that. Okay. Um, so um, do you believe in the, the, maybe over time, that the DTX testing or the DTC testing will get to the point where it will be more standard and provide more accurate testing options? I mean, it may, 
it may get more accurate with time, but do I, meaning that they have, there's more regulations, there's mm -hmm. more, yeah. um, you know, whatever, their databases are better, all of those type of things. But would I caution anybody about using this stuff to make their own determinations? Absolutely. I think, you know, in today's world with access to all this information, we've kind of been lulled into this thought process that, you know, we can figure, we, whoever we is as an individual, can figure out almost anything. And to some degree that that's correct. But just like there's subtleties in, in any profession, um, whether it's teaching, or nursing or engineering, whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, experience is, is worthwhile. So what I mean by that is, is that as a clinician who has done this type of work for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, however long uh, the clinician might be in practice, your interpretation of things is tempered by your experience. And that's invaluable. And we all know that we're all more comfortable getting into a car with a 35-year-old um, driver than a 16-year-old. <laughs> so, you know, you just, you just have to, to recognize that it's not just about the number in front of you. It's about the interpretation of that information in the context of you, your clinical findings, other information. So I, anybody who does genetic testing knows that we, you know, variants and finding variants are the bane of our existence um, because, you know, half the time you have no idea whether it's relevant to the patient. Sometimes it's clear that even though it's listed as a variant and it's not been reported before and not diagnostic, you know as the clinician based on the findings of the person that this is the, the cause for their problems. And other times you just you just don't know, or you do additional family investigation to look does the variance track with other affected people. So you know again there there's you have to have the perspective of the 35 year old driver over the 16 year old driver if you're going to go on a cross country trip. Mm -hmm. And so I don't you know. I, I hope it gets better, but in some ways, that to play devil's advocate, you could say to yourself that then people would really be lulled into the the thought process that they can they they now can control their diagnosis. And again, you know, there are some genetic disorders that the penetrance is not complete. That means you might have the gene, but doesn't mean you're going to get the disease. And unless you understand all of that you are putting yourself at risk for making poor decisions. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's a very good point. And um, we had somebody ready in a, a question, so a little um, off topic, but I guess um, she wanted to know if um, what is the most exciting diagnostic research occurring in the world and where, according to you, in the mito world? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> diagnostic? Um, yeah. Diagnostic, you know, um, you know, whole exome and whole genome are, are already available, even though whole genome's not generally covered by insurance. And so, you know, from that perspective, you know, that's already available. But of course, we all know that it doesn't detect all of of um, gene changes. So, for example, I have a a number of um, patients who have Lee disease who of all mitochondrial patients, you would think they would have a gene change and they don't. Um, and so there was a study a couple years ago that looked at a, a group of patients like that, and they found that 10% that, um, of them had what we call translation defects, meaning it wasn't the code that was the problem, it was the way the code was, was translated and converted into a, a function. And so that's that's probably, one of the more exciting um, research avenues. I talked to one of the labs about, you know, translational defect diagnosis, and they said that that's something that people are working on. So it's not going to revolutionize, you know, the tools we have, but it will add 
something for those families that don't have a gene diagnosis and and potentially confirm cases for the purposes of clinical treatment trials and those type of things. Now, where is it? Where is this research happening? I don't have a specific laboratory where where they're doing that stuff. And and there's I, there's undoubtedly lots of fascinating and incredible things happening in small labs and groups that we don't even know about because you have to remember that stuff only hits our radar when when it's you know it's not some guy in his you know dark laboratory it, it has gone through a lot of permutations and bubbled up so often we're not aware of stuff when it's just being you know implemented or or investigated yeah we just we wouldn't know yeah um just so you full circle on the person that wrote back about the nubella uh, genetic testing and i guess it's a mm -hmm. uh, person a researcher out of um harvard so that mm -hmm. created that genetic okay. testing so she wrote yeah that. i mean so Okay, so I mean, again, it, I think the same the same um, principles apply to that. You know, having trained at Harvard in genetics, do do I look at that and say, okay, well then it's good. Go, you know, you're good with that. I think the same the same limitations um, are to anything like that. And I'm sure they would say it as well, um, mm -hmm. meaning that even if they had a geneticist like myself or somebody else interpreting it and even um, providing you some direct information, they will always tell you to go to your own clinician who knows you. And it's like, you know, I get these, you know, MitoAction will, of course, do this, and UMDF does some of those ask the Mito doc questions. And they rotate through a bunch of us, and, you know, you'll get questions at times that are so specific to a patient that you would need to know everything about them that I basically will say I cannot answer that. You know, they have to – that's a individual question. And it's the same thing with this type of thing. It has to be interpreted in the context of the patient, no matter no matter what. So any of these labs are going to – just like Ambry or, or GeneDx, they tell you, you – they're not going to – they do not diagnose you with a disease. Your clinician takes that information and diagnoses you. Right. So people who are thinking about doing DTC testing, there, what would be the um, the reasoning for doing this testing? Is the main the main reasoning for doing this testing is to for um, for just for family history? Is that the main reason, or for what is the reason people would do this testing? Why would they do it? Well, people do it for lots of different reasons. I mean, again, some people just, you know, as as a, as a nation with people from everywhere, we often have no idea really what our ethnicity is. And so a lot of people are interested in that and using that to help find family members all over the country and world. So that seems to be the biggest thing that most people use it for. But, you know, some people are looking to, to try to better manage their health care. And, and that's, yeah. that's very noble and that's a good thing, but you just have to keep in mind that, as I said very early on, you might find stuff that, you know, like you had no idea if it is, if it is positive, a true positive. But again, it could be taking you down a path of, of fear an intervention that that's not not appropriate. So I would again I would I would tell anybody if you want to you know if you want to know whether you're like I said English or Spanish or German or whatever that that's that's cool. Um, but if you want to know if you have Parkinson's disease a Parkinson's disease gene mutation because your grandfather died of it, don't do Direct to consumer testing. That's a clinical question, mm -hmm. um, and that direct to consumer testing will not answer it, not answer that very specific patient specific question. This isn't just oh cool I've got a variant in something. This is this person is worried, and as a as an individual you deserve to get the best data to tell you you should or you should not worry. Yeah, I think that's wonderful advice and um, I think that was my my final question was and you answer, you just answered it for me is that um, what would what would um, qualify you to take to do this or not and it would be if you have a 
a, a question about if you have a family history of a disease that you're wondering about, you should go to your, your clinician and do the testing that way um, and not try and use this testing to figure that out, but always consult with your physician and figure out the best testing yes. for you. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, hand it back over to Kyra. And um, we're, wow, that hour went past. So I will hand it back to Kyra and thank you, Dr. Kendall, for your time. Um, Kyra? Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for those thoughtful questions. Um, so again, Dr. Kendall, we really, really appreciate you taking the time to share this information with our community because, again, knowledge is power, right? And the more information we can arm our community with, the better they are prepared to take better control of their care and work with their care team to make sure that they're headed down the right, right path. So this I know the DTC testing has been a hot topic um, in the healthcare industry, so it's really great to have some perspective from a clinician um, on the value and the limitations of these tests when you're talking about um, using them to help manage your healthcare. So we really appreciate the insight that you've provided today. Um, so we're gonna wrap up. I just wanna, just a couple of reminders to the slides um, for the call again are on our website and the recording will be available uh, later today at www.mitoaction.org. We hope that um, today's call has provided some valuable information to each of you. As you continue your day and perhaps have additional questions about today's call, feel free to reach out to MitoAction. Again, you can email info at mitoaction.org or you can email myself directly, Kyra, K-I-R-A, at mitoaction.org. And Jamie is also available at jamie at mitoaction.org. And also just an, uh, another reminder, we do have our MITO 411 support line that if you need help, you have questions, you can email us at mito411.org or you can call 1-888-MITO-411. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. Dr. Kendall, thank you again for your time, as always, sharing your expertise and for your just unwavering commitment to this community. We are forever grateful for you. So thank you everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful day and we will talk again soon. Thank you, Kyra, for the opportunity. Um, and um, again, I hope it's been helpful to everybody. So um, enjoy your weekend and uh, hopefully for wherever you are, it's, it's getting warmer. So yes. um, take care. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Kendall. Have a wonderful weekend. Take okay. care, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.